Um, and now we have up our, our panel. Um, and our panel is really going to be covering a broad set of uh, a sort of a diverse set of ideas um, and perspectives, I think, on, on how we could go about surviving through uh, and operating in the lunar night. Um, so moderating our panel is going to be another one of the extreme environments uh, cohort. That's uh, Milena, uh, Dr. Milena uh, Graziano. Hey, there you are, Milena. Hi, good to see you. Um, so we know Dr. Milena very well from, from a lot of her work with um, uh, Rad Hard Electronics. She's helped us out with that as well as other sort of general uh, material science uh, expertise. So uh, the panel is now yours to moderate. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, hoping everybody has having a great time. That was a very interesting uh, set of slides, Ben. And now we get to the panel where it's more of having our panelists introduce themselves, introduce uh, their topics, their technology, and then we can have a moment to interact, ask some questions. So this panel is supposed to be iterative and hopefully you can engage in the chat as well as raise your hand if you wanna ask a live question. So first we have Dr. Pamela E. Clark. Dr. Clark is a director of the Star Theater and instructor of space systems engineering at Moorhead State University. Prior to MSU, Dr. Clark worked for NASA at both the Goddard Space Flight Center and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. In addition to helping create the first global scale lunar database, she has been an advocate for the use of CubeSats in cislunar and deep space exploration, including leading the annual Lunar Cubes Workshop and Science PI on Lunar Ice Cube. So thank you, Dr. Clark, and take it away. Well, can you hear me all right? And see my screen? Okay, so I'm gonna, run, I'm gonna run through this very quickly because I only have five minutes. So yes, we know the lunar environment is a challenging environment. And I am interested in putting little packages on a lunar surface that can be on a 24 seven duty cycle. That's my, my goal in life is to be involved in designing something that actually work for that. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of things that are going on right now that could help to make that possible. Particularly from the standpoint of taking, you know, basically a network of uh, compact, of in-situ measurements. Th th these are some of the payload constraints from CLIPS, probably pretty much the same now as it was a couple of years ago when this slide was generated. And um, they don't have anything for the thermal um, operation because it's very, very challenging. And um, typically people have tried to use more conventional approaches to thermal design and found that it's very hard to, to survive more than a during lunar day, basically. So we've already talked about this uh, and, and this represents the lunar environment, um, basically temperature range, uh, range as a function of latitude and time of day on the lunar surface, um, indicating just how extreme the lunar environment is. And of course, one of the problems with designing instrument packages is that because with a more conventional system, batteries themselves uh, can only operate in a limited range. Um, you're typically, one of the things that's very possible to do with conventional design is to quickly get into a downward spiral of needing more resources to keep the batteries warm enough to be able to use them. And uh, you know, alternatively, RTG systems, um, you can certainly use them, but they're not that easy to get necessarily. They're relatively inefficient and expensive. So if can find, the question is, can we find an alternative? So here are some possible components that could provide an alternative in the way of thermal, uh, thermal uh, protection systems and power systems. The parabolic radiator reflectors used on the Apollo program were extremely effective in um, keeping the emissions from the lunar surface in particular um, at the instruments in the ELSA packages. And we, any design for thermal design for the lunar surface could easily incorporate that for a small package. Um, and then when they're combined with other high performance thermal components, such as the one that uh, Dave Bugby is gonna talk about later today in the pallet system. And one of the ones we talked about uh, quite a bit besides um, high performance thermal switches, multi-layer insulation and deploying um, basically from a cable system to have spacers as spacerless multi-layer insulation. This would allow by itself a much higher duty cycle operation during lunar night for, for a relatively small package. So the small packages present a great deal of problem because they have a relatively high surface area for volume. So this is where, you know, if you want to get down to the size of a large CubeSat, for example, this can be particularly challenging. Um, and this just is some, some data from the modeling that was done um, by, by David Bugby's group. Um, you know, I had asked Dave, um, basically, when I first started working at JPL, if we could look at a system that could operate small packages on the lunar surface. And it turns out he was very interested in this work. And so instead of getting a thermal switch with a capability that um, is 100 times better than you could provide with, with a, a conventional thermal switch, for example, we're talking about 
something that um, would require something about 10 times better than that, a thousand to one, instead we got 2,500 to one switching ratio, which is an indication of how effective and efficient a thermal switch can be. Then uh, the other technology that's kind of exciting to me is one that's actually uh, one of my colleagues at Moorhead is involved um, in developing, and that's a new energy storage uh, technology-based uh, flywheel with carbon fiber base, making extremely light and efficient and also developments in high-speed magnetic bearings, which would allow you to charge up whenever you had solar power and then provide very efficient, long duration, high energy density operation during lunar periods of lunar darkness. Uh, this is just a basically a quad chart, um, based a uh, one slide that indicates, okay, so Pamela bad, chemical batteries uh, need higher temperatures to function properly. We can get down to, you know, operational temperatures that are more like uh, temperatures on the lunar surface themselves and still operate this kind of flywheel. Um, they have a, a base, chemical based battery cycle life is low. The cycle lives for these with the new technology of magnetic bearings is very high. And here's just a comparison uh, between other materials in terms of things like density and total energy production and yield strength and carbon fiber definitely comes out ahead in terms of total energy and low density. So it could be a lightweight solution um, requiring some volume, but not a huge amount of volume to be able to be a, an energy storage system that when used in combination with a um, high performance um, thermal system with the newer, these newer technology, very efficient thermal components could provide a, a capability to operate on a regular duty cycle during lunar night at most places on the lunar surface. So that could mean instead of limited duty cycle, which we're talking about for some of the, this is, this is the thermal switch, basically Dave will talk more about this, but this is just an example of a kind of system, how it would operate with thermal Pamela, switches, basically. Yes. So sorry, Dr. Coit, we're running a little late, so. Okay, are you, is it five minutes? To wrap up, yeah, <laughs> if you can wrap oh, up. Oh, sorry, okay, well, here are just two, two examples, basically. This would be an infrared spectrometer system with some uh, cold temperature gimbals to be able to uh, taking pictures during the uh, lunar day, basically to, to document the environment in terms of water production. This is just one with a magnetic sounder system, so. Thank you, ask me more questions and dive into details for my talk during the question and answer period. Wonderful, thanks so much. All right, our next speaker is Ian Jakubka. Ian is the fuel cell technology lead at NASA Glenn Research Center, where he coordinates technology development for fuel cells and electrolysis to meet NASA power and energy storage needs. This includes primary fuel cells for power systems and electrolysis secondary fuel cells for energy storage systems. So Ian, if you are here, Yes, I am. Thank Wonderful. you for the introduction. All righty. Um, for the purposes of this talk, we're, we're presuming a sub kilowatt. So just to, to bound the situation, uh, if we presume a maximum output power of one kilowatt, the energy storage for an application at the South Pole is approximately 100 kilowatt hours. This maximum energy requirement is roughly on par with the energy stored within a fully charged battery pack in a Tesla Model S or Model X. Um, since this discussion is for lunar camp applications requiring less than one kilowatt of power, uh, this particular battery example provides an upper bound for the amount of energy we're talking about. And again, this is just a rough approximation so that everybody has in their own mind uh, about how much energy we're talking about. Um, for thermal, for lunar applications, uh, these uh, energy demands include both electrical and thermal energy. Uh, the previous speakers have both addressed this uh, to some level. What is nice about this is that the less efficient energy conversion technologies may become a viable option because the conversion inefficiency that's generating waste heat may become valuable because that waste heat can be used to be used in lieu of electric heaters. This would allow for a reduction in the electrical energy requirement. Uh, there is also the opportunity uh, in the event that there are large temperature differences between a chemical reaction that is exothermic and the external environment to provide very small amounts of electrical power derived from the large thermal gradient. Any of these concepts require a very high level of platform integration to manage the thermal power, 
and energy to meet the mission requirements. So this has to be taken from a whole platform level in order to get everything together. To survive a single night, uh, many controllable exothermic chemical reactions are available. Um, the most immediately obvious option is to consume any residual propellant remaining in the landing craft. Uh, depending on the mission parameters, other chemical reactions may be there as well. Um, one option that is under consideration is using a fuel cell. Uh, a fuel cell will take a chemical and provide heat and uh, a waste product and electricity. Um, while there are multiple fuel cell reactions uh, available or chemistries available for use in terrestrial application, the proton exchange membrane and solid oxide electrolyte chemistries are by far the most mature for space application. Um, taking an example from the multiple commercially available UAVs that use fuel cells, uh, NASA has a couple of active research projects looking at fuel cells in the hundreds of watt ranges. Uh, currently, we have two suborbital flight experiments that are looking at PEM-based primary fuel cell systems and a number of SBIR and tipping point contracts for advancing the solid oxide stack technologies. Trying to survive multiple nights using some sort of chemical energy storage requires a reversible chemical reactions. Uh, NASA has a, a couple of active projects looking at the hydrogen oxygen regenerative fuel cell, but these designs are focused on significantly higher energy levels. And right now, these designs show no obvious path to fit to the smaller energy level while preserving the potentially higher specific energy inherent in a hydrogen oxygen regenerative fuel cell. Potentially creative designs can be invented to take advantage of micro forces, but we don't have any active research activities going into those levels. Terrestrial applications are investigating liquid-based reversible flow batteries. Unfortunately, the current technology has these liquid-based flow batteries with an unacceptably high specific energy for space application. But with uh, additional research, uh, maybe somebody's going to find something new. And uh, with that, I uh, cede the floor back to the next speaker, unless there are any questions. Wonderful. We'll leave the questions after all the panelists have presented. But that was excellent and exactly five minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Next is Dr. Christopher Morrison. Dr. Morrison is chief engineer of USNC's Ember Core technology, which is a suit of commercial radioisotopes systems for space and terrestrial applications. While many in the surface power group are familiar with Chris and Ember Core, many may know may not know that he is passionate about education and founded a company specializing in teaching ASL. So Dr. Christopher Morrison, if you can take it away. Absolutely, you can all see my screen now, I believe. We can, thank you. All right, let me get the... F5. And let's see, just to be sure you're not seeing pictures of yourselves and little buttons from Zoom, right? You're seeing the slide. That's good. All right. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about commercial radioisotope solutions. And just for a little bit of background, uh, NASA has been using plutonium-238 for a long time. It's, it's an amazing material. It has an 87-year half-life if you're going to Pluto or you know, New Horizons, Voyager, Cassini. There's a whole host of over 30 missions that have utilized these, both as for electric power in an MMRTG and as a thermal power heater in a RU or an RHU. Now, one of the challenges is there's a limited supply of plutonium and it's a very controlled material since it's what we call an actinide and can be used in a lot of kind of weapons, nuclear weapons type production activities. Um, but, you know, NASA picked it for a reason. It was a really good radioisotope what I'm here to talk to you about are the commercial options. There are commercial options out there that are more from the medical industry. Um, in particular, the ones that I can mention here are thulium-170 and cobalt-60. And both of these isotopes actually have a much higher power density when you look at watts per gram. And 
to some degree have a much have a you know various degrees of total energy but if you're going to the moon you know you don't necessarily need a 90 year half life you might be able to look at something with a shorter half life so the shorter the half life generally the higher the power of the device and if you're looking to survive on the moon for perhaps a year or so thulium would be great um, if you're looking for longer something like cobalt would be great and just to throw out some numbers here, usually when we talk about batteries, we're talking about 100, you know, watt hours per kilogram. Well, radioisotopes possess really millions of watt hours per kilogram to even cobalt 60 being a, a gigawatt hour over a gigawatt hour per kilogram. So this is just a fantastical amount of, of energy. Now, there are a lot of uh, strings attached to this energy and that you can't control how you use it. They just produces heat. It will produce heat during the lunar day. It will produce heat during the lunar night. Um, and it produces heat according to a decay curve that it just, you know, uh, 129 days later, for example, thulium, it's half-life, it will produce half as much power. And another 129 days, it'll produce half as much again. So it's, it's uh, especially for the shorter lived ones, it's a, dispose, it's a uh, decaying product. And another piece of this is that some of these have uh, more x-rays. We like plutonium-238 because it doesn't produce a lot of x-rays. Um, but some of these other ones, you have to have shielding. So it's a little bit disingenuous for me to advertise, you know, megawatt hours per kilogram when there's more of a system to put together there. But because there's so much energy you're starting with, um, it's just an amazing amount of energy that that is 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 out there. And just what we are what we are pioneering is a little um, unit cell. Actually, I don't know if you can see the little tiny one in my hand. Um, it's very small. Um, this is about an eight millimeter diameter, eight millimeter height pellet. And with our thulium technology that we're focusing on first, each of these could produce up to five watts of thermal energy, and you know about the size of a smarty. And our our production method really focuses on. Um, inexpense, you know, being being much cheaper than, for example, plutonium production and being much more scalable than than other ones. We don't do uh, radioisotope reprocessing or anything like that. We produce a, a, something in a lab. We put it in a reactor where the neutrons in the reactor activate the material of interest. And then we package it in a hot cell. And this is another fact is that we have two ceramics, an outer ceramic that serves as an encapsulant and the inner ceramic, which actually serves as the thing that absorbs neutrons and turns into the isotope of choice. Um, so this is kind of our lunar power concept. Um, oops, let me have that deploy right there. Oh. Uh. So animations are a little bit finicky sometimes. <laughs> um, well, uh, let me try this one more time. There we go. Okay, so you can kind of see this is the actual system that we're proposing compared to the size of an apple for something that could produce between one and 40 watts to survive the lunar night. And that's kind of what we've narrowed down to um, uh, basically say, okay, uh, what's our first easiest, simplest uh, product line that we could develop? And this is kind of what we're looking at is uh, these pellets are in the middle. They're surrounded by something called a sealed source container, which is for regulatory purposes and ground transport. Um, that's inside of a shield, um, which is the next layer. And, and then outside of that is, a, is an aero shell. And uh, this composes a really basic heater, no moving parts, no electrical control system. This gets buttoned up and maybe put into a lander or a rover. So just, you know, just to throw out some of the facts is that where we can offer a lot of value is, of course, in our incredible power density. So if you're looking at surviving the lunar night, maybe you're looking at 20 watts of thermal, which is very much in line with our first product, um, then we offer, you know, a pretty good mass decrease, but an insanely good actually volumetric decrease as well. Um, and I'll just breeze through the rest of these slides as I don't have a ton of time. We have a, we are out of time, but we can yeah. revisit that later in your talk and if you can wrap up. Yeah, so you can make electricity with it. That's the next step after we produce the heater. And just so you know, this produces x-rays. So you might get a free science instrument out of this as well if, if you want to build it in that configuration. So a lot of people worry about the regulatory pathways, but I will say this is designed from the ground up for uh, regulatory addressing regulatory concerns and implementing the uh, NPSM 20 regulatory requirements rolled out in 2019. So with that, if you're interested, I'd love to talk more. Thanks so much. And we will have uh, space for everybody to ask questions and when you can further a little bit on your slides.
So thank you so much. Next, we have Richard Weftering. Rich has been an electrical engineer at NASA Glenn Research Center since 1985 and currently a member of the Power Architecture and Analysis Branch. In addition to work on microgravity, 3D printing, space logistics, supportability, modular po power systems, he is an advocate for lunar power hibernation that includes the development of power systems capable of surviving lunar night and operating in the extreme cold to extend operational life of solar powered lunar robotics and landers. So Richard, if you're here, you can take it away. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah, this is Richard Eftering, I'm the NASA Glenn Research Center. Um, uh, there, here we go. Okay, so I'm, we're going to be talking about the lunar power hibernation approach. It's aimed at low cost solar powered spacecraft, for instance, like the Eclipse lander or similar. It's intended to extend the mission capability. Right now, they're only one day, you know, one day light session uh, at once you land on the moon. And we like to get multiple lunar cycles out of them. So hibernation assumes that the batteries are using something like the common 18650 lithium ion cells uh, that we've uh, determined that are widely used in spacecraft, but we've recently determined that they can tolerate a freeze-thaw cycle. And not only can they tolerate the cycle, but when they're returned to normal temperature, they actually recover their charge up, uh, their charge capacity. So that to minimize the mass and cost impact, and because we are talking about modifying existing spacecraft, we can start by limiting the cold operations, which is probably between 1500K and the lunar night, particularly around the lunar dawn, uh, to the main bus and battery controls. Uh, everything else can wait for the temperatures to return to normal. For landers, by the way, many of these flight systems are inactive after landing anyway. So, so there's a, a, a subset of these systems that are basically no longer used. So many electronic systems, existing electronics, can actually be partially cryotolerant. In other words, they can tolerate exposure to extreme temperatures. The limit, uh, if we limit the operation to the normal temperature design range, which is typically 125 to 50, minus 55 C, the electronics uh, should survive. Now, uh, conventional printed circuit boards that you'll be using for the electronics uh, usually can survive, but usually have a short cycle life. In other words, they they don't like being going, going through multiple cycles. Um, if you have a, uh, a apparatus or a circuit that's built to a high reliability standards, so sometimes referred to hybrid microcircuits, generally that improves the crowd tolerance of the design. Next page. So uh, I always have to be careful I don't, don't go off the, you know, into space with this one. So the thing I want to point out here, there's we want to be active control and involves the solar rays at lunar dawn because hibernation is simple. Recovering is a complicated part. The main bus controller, uh, and then off to the uh, lower, lower left is the battery management system. These all have to come up at lunar dawn or shortly after and begin managing the main bus. Um, the main battery management system of the battery, which by the way is isolated during the hibernation period to prevent it being charged or discharged while in a frozen state. Now, the main bus controller is basically running heaters and, and, and bringing up the system uh, methodically. The systems on the right, uh, the, in the light blue, are all uh, avionics, your common avionics, and they are also being heated slowly, and they are generally passive through this process. Next slide. So um, if we want to upgrade, you know, you don't want to have a mix of, you know, cryo and cryo-operable uh, electronics. You want everything to operate. Uh, you, first of all, you gotta make sure everything is cryo So then, uh, it's primarily a packaging issue. You wanna adopt packaging materials, processes, minimize coefficient thermal expansion mismatch. Uh, if you're relying on uh, devices that are made by high reliability techniques, uh, they put a lot of effort into matching thermal um, expansion. Uh, you wanna maintain flat thermal gradients on your components. Uh, to minimize stress. You want to replace plastic encapsulation with other low CTE compounds or even just put them in a high, uh, hermetically sealed container. Now size matters also when you're doing uh, uh, devices in the cryo environment. Small sizes have lower stresses. Now upgrading to a cryo operable, in other words, capable of operating in the lunar cold, uh, is, is the key thing here is to understand the underlying semiconductor temperature dependent mechanisms like carrier freeze out and electron tunneling. So you need to understand the physics 
of the semiconductor. Another main thing is that you, it's not a matter of just picking the right semiconductor. Uh, the transistor architecture matters. For instance, field effect transistors are much better than bipolar. If you have silicon on insulator FETs versus bulk FETs, you're going to get better performance. Depletion mode works better than enhancement mode. And then uh, like the new generation of GAN devices based on high electron mobility is, is better than most everyone because of flat response. You want your semiconductors and the passes to have flat response to temperatures. And if you have to deal with mixed technologies, you may need some temperature compensation. So finally to add to here is that to, to advance the cryoelectronics uh, to, to mainstream, we need to, A, we, we need cryoelectronic design guidelines for system designers. Uh, we really don't have that. Um, it has to, we have to be able to have access to physics informed modeling and simulation tools. And the manufacturers really don't provide data in the 405 to 50K range, uh, and they probably will never will, but we'll have to perform uh, testing on devices uh, to, to accomplish that. And finally, cryoelectronics is the key to hibernation, but it's also key to building robust spacecraft because electronics is innately compatible with the lunar environment, regardless of temperature. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Mike Provenzano. Mike is responsible for leading the development of astrobotics, planetary rover and power infrastructure technologies, as well as generating mobile and power sales as a service. He leads a mixed team of professionals to develop the world's first and smallest commercial lunar rover, the Cube Rover. Mike's team is also responsible for leading the development of an 18 kilogram autonomous lunar rover, called Moon Ranger and the first space-based wireless charging system. An entrepreneur formerly selected as Poets and Quant's Top 100 Global M MBAs, Mike specializes in making early technologies marketable. Mr. Provenzano has a history managing complex space projects, including work on the Boeing Space Launch System and leading the development of an NSF-funded i side team at Carnegie Mellon, researching electromagnetic transportation from the lunar surface. So Mike, take it away. Thanks very much for the introduction, Melina. And, and you said my name correctly, so I appreciate that. So great, all right. So it looks like the slides are being shared here. I can walk through them together. Uh, appreciate being here. So we're gonna talk through some of our solutions to survive the intense challenges of uh, lunar night conditions and also some of the other technologies that we've been developing here that are relevant to that. So we can go to the next slide. So just for those that may not be aware, uh, Astrobotic is involved in a few different uh, technologies right now. We have landers and rovers and also a lot of terrain relative navigation solutions. Uh, things like our Peregrine uh, that's gonna be flying later this year. So uh, that's uh, supported uh, through the CLIPS program. And then we also have our Moon Ranger rover as uh, was mentioned earlier, that's gonna be flying in 2023 under task order 19C. That's an autonomous rover that's gonna be looking for ice at the south pole of the moon. And then we have our Griffin Viper mission. It's a very exciting mission. It's gonna be carrying NASA's Viper rover. It's gonna be flying in 2024. And then most recently we uh, have a new opportunity that's our Q rover. It's gonna be flying in 2025. And it's gonna be uh, demonstrating a lot of groundbreaking technologies that I can unfortunately share today, but we will be announcing very soon. We can go to the next slide. So some of the things we think about when we're designing our systems, this is the example of a very small rover, our Cube Rover. So we've been talking to a number of different groups that are out there that could provide commercial RHUs. Um, Chris had a great presentation here from USNC, and I think that's a, another example of a great commercially provided solution that can work on small rovers like this. Uh, one of the challenges when you put an RHU on board is that it's providing heat throughout the entire duration of the mission. So while that's great during the really cold temperatures, that can be a problem during the warm temperatures during the day. So in those cases, it's useful to utilize a lot of other solutions that can complement the, the thermal management system. And that's really like thermal switches. Um, David Bugby's group, uh, as was presented earlier, has really uh, pioneered a lot of these solutions and companies like ACT are also developing them as well. And they can help us passively and conductively link heat from sensitive thermal components inside the rover to our radiator. So we can get out heat when we need to, and then we can uh, disconnect and we can make sure that things stay warm when it's really cold temperatures. We can go to the next slide. 
And then some other technologies that we're working on are our wireless chargers. So we're working with Wybotic and University of Washington and Bosch, uh, as well as NASA Glenn Research Center to develop these systems. So these have already been tested in industrial applications. They've already been deployed underwater by our partner Wybotic. Really, Astrobotic is helping them bring them to the moon. And right now, what you can see is some images of 3D printed rovers that we have here on site and we're testing the wireless charging capabilities. So these are actually 85% efficient. So these are near field wireless chargers. You can approach at different angles. Uh, you can be, uh, they're tolerant of horizontal and uh, vertical uh, misalignment. So you can be really just, you just need to be close by about four centimeters. There can be dust in between there. It doesn't impact the power transfer. And this is a really great solution for power distribution on the surface, because now you don't have to worry about dust. You don't have to worry about uh, getting in uh, very difficult autonomous solutions that could link uh, mechanical linkages. You don't have to worry about the force that's required to sometimes put those linkages together, especially if you're operating a small robot. And then uh, this wireless charger is actually going to be flying to the moon. It's going to be used on Kennedy Space Center's pilot excavator rover, which we're really excited about and which we're also teamed with that, uh, that center on to develop. Uh, we're providing the electronics and some of the software solutions that are going on that rover. So it makes sense that wireless charging would support that rover and also some of the smaller rovers. We think that's a great solution to offer power to assets to survive the lunar night. So really, if you have a lander, if you have a VSAT uh, that's providing a lot of power, you could put these wireless chargers at the base of those systems to provide power to other assets so that they can trickle charge throughout the lunar night and not necessarily need to bring an RHU or other systems along the ride. And then we can go to my last slide here. Great. So this is our VSAT solution. So some of the points I want to highlight here is that VSAT it's a vertical stands for vertical solar array technology. This is something that NASA has pioneered, and that Astrobotic is one of the competitors uh, today that's going to be competing on the, the phase two of this opportunity. And VSAT really represents the lowest cost, commercially friendly, high TRL solution that has the fewest policy barriers to deployment on the moon. So we're really excited about this technology. Companies like us see this as a means to provide power as a service and power is really the, the backbone of the infrastructure that we need to start surviving the night. So our VSAT has wireless chargers that are affixed to the base of the station as well as cabled solutions. So as a means of uh, providing different power to different assets. And we use our cube rovers to deploy from our VSAT and bring power to different locations. So you can imagine a VSAT might be deployed at the top of a crater rim. We could have our smaller rovers drive down into the crater permanently shadowed regions with a tether to provide power either through an actual mechanical linkage electromechanical linkage or a wireless charging system to power different assets. But VSAT can also be scaled up or down. Right now we're designing it to support 10 kilowatts, but it can be sub kilowatt. It can also be higher than 10 kilowatts. We have a number of different sizes that can support those different applications. So excited to talk to you more today about that and answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Thanks so much. All right, and last but not least, we have Josh Rudin. Josh is principal engineer of at Nanoomics where he leads technical teams in execution of R&D programs for commercial clients from concept to full production, as well as authors and executes grant proposals in pursuit of our company's internal development objectives for sensors, software, power systems. Nanoomics is a recent recipient of a NASA SBIR. So congratulations and take it away. All right, thank you. And also just uh, like to recognize Melina's lighting in her office is very, uh, very nice. So. <laughs> yes, I keep it festive. <laughs> That's great. So thank you for inviting me. I'm uh, happy to be here and talk a little bit about um, what we do um, from very high level. Like Melina mentioned, we were just awarded a NASA SBR phase one um, that started this week. So we don't really have results to show, but we can talk about uh, kind of our background and things we were working on. Um, um, you can go on to the next slide. So just some information about nanomics. Um, we're about 45 uh, people, uh, almost all, uh, you know, I guess, technical degree people um, and some PhDs. So we sort of straddle between academia and industry. Um, so we do a lot of work, either, you know, contract engineering and science work for um, commercial entities, but as, uh, as well as a lot of, um, you know, government contracting using the SBIR vehicles or STTR vehicles. So if there's um, you know, everything we do is kind of, you know, team-based. There's a, you know, large team of people behind me supporting all this work. 
if folks on the line are interested in finding out more about SBIR or STTR or how that works or being partners on any of these topics, um, we'd be uh, happy to talk about that as well. Um, Anomics uh, focus areas are kind of spread over a wide uh, variety of topic areas, but a lot of it's in materials, electronics. Uh, we have some photonic uh, uh, systems and sensors. Um, uh, we recently uh, put a, a spectral camera on the ISS. Um, the mission's coming to a close here pretty soon. Um, but NASA work is just a, a, a portion of what we do, um, and a lot of it's with other um, kind of defense entities. Um, uh, next slide. So in particular, I guess, uh, in relationship to what we're talking about today, we just were awarded this uh, uh, phase one program. Uh, one of the things we were, we've been working on are thermoelectric devices, and I think people are probably familiar with, um, you know, what these things are, uh, convert electricity into thermal uh, flux, essentially. Um, and, you know, in the science in that area, most of the focus has been on improved material mixtures, uh, uh, material processing uh, methods, you know, crystal orientations to improve the ZTE, you know, the figure of merit for these things or the efficiency. But, um, you know, it's kind of the engineer's uh, side of it. You know, there's, we think there's been opportunities missed in, you know, novel configurations of these devices and, and, this, and applications. Uh, for example, thinking about you know what we talked about earlier, the 18650 battery, sort of a conventional approach to to thermal or uh, electrical energy storage, you know, in a extreme environment, um, you know, you might have resistive heaters to keep those warm during a cold period, and then insulate. Um, uh, but consider thermoelectric devices as as not just uh, energy generations, coolers, but also heaters. Um, you know, it's a device that can have you know more heat flux effect than a resistive heater. Um, that people kind of don't really make that connection. Um, so we're kind of looking into that area using thermoelectrics as a means to control the uh, thermal flux uh, from you know, an insulated volume to an external radiator, perhaps, you know, sort of a similar to you know, thermal switching, but a more continuous way to do that with kind of no moving parts. Um, and again, you know, most applications, uh, uh, thermoelectrics have been you know, very, very custom you know, um, elements like on the MMRTG, or you know, um, commercial modules that are you know those white alumina plates and sort of a series um, a set of legs, thermoelectric legs in there. Um, but we're starting to build our own devices with you know uh, H uh, series parallel configurations that are more robust to, to single element failures and to increase uh, you know, robustness in extreme environments. And also building into you know curved enclosures uh, so that we reduce the amount of material you know for surrounding a curved uh, element that we want to cool. So some of our works with you know, uh, sensors, focal plane arrays, uh, INUs, things like that. Um, next slide. So this is a little bit small, but just an example of some of our programs we've been do doing uh, prior to this uh, NASA one. Uh, the first one was a low cost. Thermoelectric cooling system for uh, on detector electronics. This is uh, cooling uh, like a focal plane array for a, a, a DOE kind of program. Uh, the second one that uh, we just wrapped up was a thermoelectric integrated uh, suit, welding suit for Navy uh, welders. So it's like the personnel to build the ships. Um, they're changing the requirements for the materials used in the construction of, of submarines, essentially. And so the welders have to operate it their equipment at higher temperatures and they're looking for ways to actively cool uh, the people doing that work. Uh, conformal uh, TECs for laser enclosure cooling, you know, a lot of applications have, you know, non-flat surfaces, you know, as soon as you build a heat spreader or some other kind of, uh, you know, mechanical element to attach a flat thermoelectric device to a curved uh, entity, you're just adding, you know, thermal path. And so by uh, constructing the, the TEC elements in a curved manner from the start, um, you can you know, eliminate that, that part of it. And then you know, this membrane supported thermoelectric generator, you know, we've been doing some research and development in uh, flexible substrates for thermoelectric devices. So uh, with the idea of essentially creating the thermoelectric legs in a flexible matrix, which is like a fiberglass mat that would allow you know, two-dimensional flexibility over surfaces. So these are just a few examples of things we're working on, and we're excited to get started with this SBIR program. And you know, uh, Ask Robotics is one of our partners, and we've got some other academic partners on this one as well. Um, so yeah, really excited. Thanks for the opportunity to to talk today, and uh, we're open to any questions. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Okay.
Okay, so as I mentioned before, this is now an open panel for your questions. We are monitoring the chat and also the Q&A section of our, of our workshop. So please submit your questions there. Um, there is one that is pending an answer from Dr. Clark, so I'll read that one. What is the current TRL for space applications of the flywheels mentioned uh, by Dr. Clark? So I'd say the, the, the TRL, um, this was originally a space application. The TRL is probably something on the order of two or three at this point. Much higher TRL for the uh, thermal switch and the other technologies that Dave Bugby will talk about later. So uh, actually, we're hoping to submit an, an SPIR, move the TRL up. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Paul Lees asks, many thermal switches are bespoke or in design phase. Are there plans to make a generalized high TRL level available to the community as it is a key driving technology for lunar operations? And that is open for all panelists. Yeah, I mean, it's right now, um, they're actually going to be, I know that David Bugby is going to be flying thermal switches on some early clips missions. So once it's a verified and proven technology, it'll be available to the community. Absolutely. Okay, I guess I do have a general question that I'd like to ask all the panelists, maybe share your thoughts on it. Um, what do you see as the hardest part of the complete system design for night survival and operation? I can answer that. I, you know, I thought about, I, I just, I have thought about thermal. I've been working on trying to solve this problem for a long time now with various thermal engineers. So um, the hardest part really is as someone, I forget the speaker earlier on the panel who mentioned that the integration part is, is tricky. So figuring out, um, it's always been tricky to kind of um, figure out how much power, how much, you, you have to have a storage system basically, and also another source of power. And that kind of power system adds complexity. And then trying to figure out um, what you can live with in the way of, uh, for, for so far with limited duty cycle, it makes for some complexity also in designing a system that um, allows you to um, generate, you know, basically generate a small amount of heat when you're, when you're using a system. So it does actually help you to be using your system on at least a limited duty cycle and doing careful thermal design. I consider that to be that one of the most crucial aspects of doing any thermal instrument, any, any lunar instrument package, whether it's flying or on the surface and it, as the people who are flying on Artemis uh, one, I'm sure have discovered, or just flying CubeSats on the moon, um, neglecting the, th the thermal is in fact, one of the most challenging aspect for a lot of us. So yeah, it's, it's really critical to do well integrated design with a, a lot of, somebody with a lot of um, thermal background for small packages. Thank you. Does anybody else in the panel have thoughts on the hardest part of the complete system design for night survival and operation? I mean, I could add a few words there as well. Uh, I would just mention that uh, one of the things we're looking at is that there really is no single solution for all these different challenges. I think all of them are the correct answer. And really we deal with customers and partners that want to do lots of different things on the surface. So uh, I think it's a combination of RHUs, RTGs, thermal switches, parabolic radiators, all these kinds of phase changing materials that can help us keep our systems alive and operate throughout the lunar night. Some of the things that we're seeing though, as we're working uh, with our different partners is that I think regulatory challenges, administrative challenges with approving commercially provided radioactive solutions is going to be one of the things that needs to be our near-term focus. And I think there's a lot of good and exciting progress in that area, but uh, we would really like to, as one of the, the groups that would utilize those solutions, see some advancement in that area. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I'll just add that a lot of the best solutions combine technologies. If you want reliability, um, you know, a nuclear solution and a solar solution, they're not exclusive. In fact, they, they like each other and there's a lot of ways where they complement each other in, in what they do. So when mission designers are, are, are looking at the mission, you know, I just would encourage them to look at, Hey, what can we do to make this more robust? It's not just about meeting a really basic requirement and what about thriving you know th think about you know more than just barely meeting the requirement often uh but it, it's it's something where if you use the right combination of technologies you really can enable kind of the future uh lunar commercial market and there's there, you're going to need all of the above i do agree with you the more we hear about each technology that can be a candidate but their limitations the more we see that a combination is probably going to be the best bet 
to tackle the problems that we are we are seeing in the near future. Um, Richard, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, my theme has been uh, we can try to make the equipment more compatible with the environment it's in rather than put everything in warm boxes and deal with that thermal problem. If we can get the electronics, even if it's just a couple hundred degrees lower temperature uh, and, and operate and could be reliable, uh, we can just you know, get rid of some of this extra heaters that we require, and uh, and it becomes a much easier problem to deal with. You know, again, this is more like making yourself compatible with the environment you're in. Oh yes, I know all about the environment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, somebody else has a comment. I'd I'd like to comment. Um, one of the challenges, if you're talking about um, small packages is you, you, you need to choose a kind of a minimalist system that's gonna work for you. So a robust solution may work if you have unlimited mass power and volume, and that could work for very large systems. But you know we're talking about using the CubeSat paradigm because it allows a lot more opportunities for payloads, which are relatively easy to integrate. So coming up with you know, something that works as a minimalist system and also that's reconfigurable, which is one of the things that uh, Dave Bugby has been thinking about also. And I have along with that, when I was working it with them at JPL, um, is going to be really critical to, to make something like this work for people who want to fly small payloads, which I'd like to see a lot of on the moon. I have to admit that's my that's an interest. <laughs> Josh, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to mention that you know what Pamela said in the beginning, just looking at you know our experience putting something on the ISS and the CubeSat kind of form you know a multiple you know like a six U size shape versus what we're trying to do on the moon is that the size is such a big deal on the moon, like going smaller is so much harder than it, than you think it would be in you know, low, low Earth orbit where CubeSats seem to be doing okay. So yeah, I think I share that, you know, getting to a small size of lunar applications is great because, you know, it's just less stuff to worry about, but definitely thermal issues become bigger. Absolutely. We have a question in the chat. Um, I have not heard anyone talking about thermal isolation for avionics power systems. What are your considerations there? Well, yeah, I think that's really important. That's why um, David Bugby's notion of the um, spacerless MLI, where we actually do have a lot of isolation built in, a minimal amount of touching, um, is actually, um, it, it, that has to be considered as well. I mean, and the thermal switches basically operate in that way in a sense because they don't allow heat to be transferred. It's extremely difficult with a high, with a high performance one to, to transfer heat. So you can keep things, um, basically keep things warm enough during lunar night, which is probably the, the biggest challenge overall. I completely agree. And I, I would second that. I'd say the thermal switch is, is a critical part of our design and, and a lot of our systems right now. We can't, we can't operate without that if we want to survive lunar night. So um, agree with that. And I also would mention that uh, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about materials either, but there are advancements on the material side in terms of uh, PCBs, things that could actually hang out during the lunar night. And actually, we tested our wireless charger recently down to lunar night temperatures um, using liquid uh, liquid hydrogen. <laughs> I think I got that right. Um, and uh, it actually performed uh, very well down to negative 196 uh, Celsius. So uh, I think there's a lot of advancements in that area that uh, teams could look at too. That's really important because, as you know, our tin-rich solders don't do well in cryogenics because they tend to become very brittle. Conformal coats do not do very well. Non-metallics do not like to go very cold. So I actually would be very interested in seeing some of your results if you ever publish them. Um, I have a question here. What are the best ways to motivate integrated system thermal design? Are existing funding mechanisms helping us rise to the challenge? I'll jump in and, and just put out a, a, a gripe that the PRISM call specifically disallowed radioisotopes. Um, so some of these are just use your imagination, because I think when I tried to talk to people, they said, oh, that's because we wanted to say that plutonium-238 wouldn't be available. But it effectively disallowed our tech, you know, the technology I wanted to send, and, and that was a funding mechanism. So I would just say, uh, I'd like to see a lot more open and imagination rather than strict, you know, you know, the Watts on the moon challenge was another example of this. I'm thinking when I first heard the name of the challenge, I'm like, oh, this would be great for a ready stuff. We'll produce a Watt on the moon. And then I look at it and it's, it's, you shall use solar. And there's a row, it's really, we should have been called the distribution challenge, right? The, the Watt distribution challenge, because it's more about distribution technology. So I would just say, I'd like to put a challenge out there. Hey, NASA, hey, hey, people listening right now, 
consider radioisotopes when you look at these funding opportunities and these competitions. Thank you very much. Any other thoughts on that inquiry? Uh, I do. Yeah, I think that the um, I understand that there are limited opportunities so far because you really haven't fully engaged a, a commercial alternative to getting to the lunar surface. But really, the prism calls have been kind of restricted to pretty far along in terms of TRL development for just about any component, including the instruments. It's been in that sense, it's been really disappointing. And if you're not going to test, you know, basically new instruments that are that still need some some work to be finished, then the other supporting technologies aren't going to go either. So. I think more opportunities to do um, lower TRL, things that could maybe be TRL-5 and fly, which is, you know, again, supports, that's part of the CubeSat paradigm to be able to do that. I think that would be good to be able to create a program that would create more opportunities. I think it'll be somewhat, when we get the commercial stuff operating, that could be largely rectified, which I think will be great. Great. Um, I see another question. Josh mentioned some DOD overlap in interest. To all panelists, do you think there's significant awareness across domains for these technologies, DOD, terrestrial applications, et cetera? In my particular case, uh, the, the work we've done was attracted by the NASA NIAC program to look at radioisotope electric propulsion, which actually attracted the interest of um, the uh, DOD's uh, DIU. And we're actually performing on a phase one contract for looking at a spacecraft in cislunar space. So yeah, this, this technology as a whole, the technology suite has attracted a lot of the attention of people who might want sun independent uh, power solutions. So in that sense, uh, I think there is a lot of overlap, at least in my area. I agree. I'd say that uh, thinking about VSAT from our perspective, there's a lot of it's a very complex system and there's a lot of components that comprise that system, which I think are very valuable in different industries. For example, having long range power distribution at high voltages and rad hard solutions is one of the key technology gaps that NASA has highlighted. And I think that solving that problem could definitely be uh, useful for different industries like DOE, probably even DOD applications. So we're looking into that now. I see a question in the chat. Can the panel discuss what is the practical burden of approval, sign off paperwork, et cetera, needed to fly a mass of radioisotope as part of a payload to the moon and the mindset behind the regulations? Complicated question. <laughs> I think Chris should answer that. Yeah, sorry, I got distracted for a second. Yeah, so the the um, in 2019, there's a memorandum put out by the president that directed the FAA to do commercial launch, and um, it, it was actually a really good memorandum. And we're we're working with the FAA right now to try to implement that. And I think uh, one thing that would help is just any any additional input to the FAA because the FAA one every time they get a budget request, they get underfunded, so they're perpetually understaffed. And trying to get the experts that could actually evaluate our application would ex expedite our process. But I will say there's a there is a process put forward, um, but the the what we call rulemaking or the official kind of um, you know the FAA has been tasked to to regulate this, and they know they have, but do they have the right people, the right resources, and um, any any additional funding or help or emphasis in that direction for the FAA would help us a lot right now, um, and. In terms of to the moon, all we really care about is launch accident failures from the FAA standpoint that, hey, uh, if if the rocket has a launch failure, what happens? And our strategy is, is that the DOE has pioneered a lot of these methods for uh, curiosity and perseverance. So this these, these kind of analysis methods have been, they've worked, they've been done but they've been in another department, the DOE slash NASA, as opposed to the FAA. So I guess uh, the biggest thing that can help us is, is trying to have more support from the FAA and pushing the FAA to actually evaluate our applications. But we are working through the process and there's an open process. And Chris, maybe a, this might be a question for you is, uh, do you think that it's also beneficial to have uh, less reliance on US radioactive reserves and potentially utilize international reserves for uh, some of these space applications? Is that something that maybe we should consider as, as a country? Yeah, I'll say there's, there's a, a lot of pieces here. Um, we particularly have 
our, our radioisotope technology, since we do medical radioisotope basis, is that there's a supply chain that is around the world, and we can produce radioisotopes in Europe, in Canada, um, and we are working on building that supply chain, and that is something we're doing. Um, now, when it comes to special nuclear materials, that's like plutonium and a few of the actinides, uh, those get a lot harder. There's a lot more export control rules, but we've kind of purposely avoided that and tritium gets hit a little bit by that because it is a a a fusion kind of uh bomb type device uh so there's more rules associated with with tritium but we've taken an approach to try to just go for the technologies that are the most open and inclusive um as a company but i think uh there are um there are there are pathways right now that that could be better supported for looking at international. I think it's more of a policy question than a, right now, if you're in France or you're in Europe, they don't have launch a, a pathway to launch radioisotope materials. So I think it's, in my mind, it might be more of a, of a policy question that's if someone in France wanted to do this, they can't because there's just no rules and France has never done it. They talk about it and England's working on an americium thing and, and France is talking about it. But um, I would say, the, the materials we can figure out right now, it's more of the, the policy questions right now, the only place that can do it is the United States. So a quick question from a colleague. It sounds like um, designing for the environment is critical. How would you design for being in the poles versus in the mid latitudes and which is harder in your opinion? I'm willing to take a, a shot at that. We've been looking at the, uh, both the lunar equator and lunar south pole, and the temperature extremes are fairly similar. So from a thermal perspective, there's really not a lot of difference. It's how long are you being thermally soaked? And that changes particularly, um, particularly when you start talking scale. If you have a large thermal mass, potentially your thermal mass can dampen some of those thermal profiles. But at the equator, it's a longer thermal soak, but the fundamental design issues are similar. I would say that um, from the standpoint of, we can solve the problem of being able to survive 14 days of lunar night at the equator. That, um, I mean, that, that actually in some ways is an easier problem, it's more predictable. At the poles, it really depends so much on locality. And there can be very, very long duration night or very, very long duration day. If you can get the, you know, if you can, I, I look at most of the moon is like, is like the equator in the sense that you have an extreme high and extreme low for 14 days each. And um, I, I'm, I have the feeling that we'll be able to operate, once we can solve that problem, make a package that can operate without being enormous because it's extremely efficient thermally and has good energy storage capabilities. And we'll be able to go virtually anywhere, except there are gonna be places where it's, the light is so long that maybe there'll be special requirements if we wanna go inside a, a crater, for example, that's uh, dark most of the time. I think that's in a sense a more challenging problem, even though the possibility does exist that we can find some clever solution where we can be in the daylight a long time and then you know go in for shorter hops, basically into a darker place on the poles. But there's still nothing like you know a, a point of a eternal light, which we thought there were even ten years ago, and so that means that you know, I think I just think it's, that the polar problem is kind of harder because of the local variation. But I do think that we can be clever about it, and that's all you know. That's the big part of designing any small packages anyway. You got to be really clever about how you do things, and once if we can do that, we can maybe deal with this getting in and going in and out of the light thing at the poles. Does any other panelists want to comment on this? I'd say just with the radioisotope solution, I'd encourage people to think about even pushing it further, you know, going into the permanently shadowed regions for long periods of time. Like Viper has a very complicated profile to try to survive. Um, if it had a few radioisotopes, my understanding is the Viper mass is a lot of batteries. Um, so, you know, the the, some of these things that might be thought impossible, such as explore, exploring a cave, for example, you know, if I was to tell you what the most challenging part is, you know, going into a cave or into a permanently shadowed region, but most people think that's too hard to achieve, but courage challenge people to say, hey, we, we might be able to challenge that paradigm. Richard, were you going to say something? 
Yeah, I, I think that one of the problems with the like, equatorial region is that we have a huge swing between the coldest temperatures. Because if you look at, you know, like the, the data from uh, LRO, I mean, you were, your lunar night seems to fall within a, a 70 to 90 K region for, um, for most latitudes, even, even, the, even the equatorial one. And, but if you're getting into the polar area where you wind up like a four and a half month winter seasonal uh, night, um, you'll get down to 50. But the, the, when, you, when you have your electronics, and in my case, I'm trying not to, trying not to use heaters all the time. I'm trying to keep the thing compatible with the full range. That's a real challenge to, to, to basically have it swing from 400K down to 50K and, and still not you know, incur any uh, cycle damage. But we know we can survive lunar day. The Apollo guys did it. <laughs> and so the lunar day isn't really that challenging if you um, use the, the, uh, the, uh, the special kind of parabolic radiators that they use. And so the big challenge, once you've solved that problem, you know it can operate, you can stay cool enough to operate within normal avionics range for most of your components, except things that are especially designed to be external for the cold, like the new cold temperature gimbals. But you know, the real challenge then becomes um, how do you operate? I mean, I'm not interested in just surviving during lunar night. To me, that's boring because we've already done it. So how do you operate during lunar night, which means that you have to be able to trap heat so efficiently that you could at least on operate on a limited duty cycle by turning the instruments on um, for limited periods of time and getting enough data to make sense. I mean, ultimately we want something so efficient in, in terms of energy storage. Actually what we really want, and this is why I'm so excited about these lightweight um, new technology flywheels is something that can really be extremely efficient about storing energy. And, be relatively small, not like batteries, which require you to keep them warm enough, unless it's RTGs, of course, um, to do this. So I think that the challenge really is still surviving, is, is operating, not surviving, because we know how to operate, know how to survive during lunar night, but being able to operate during lunar night. Right now, we could fly things that could operate on a limited duty cycle during lunar night. We chose to do so. So the next stage is full 24-7 operation during lunar night with a system that's efficient enough thermally and has... Uh, Great energy storage, even at really cold temperatures, to make that possible. That, to me, is the is the real challenge. Great, thank you so much. So I see Wes turn on his camera, so I'm guessing you're going to take it over. I want to thank all the panelists and thank. I think you can take it there. Okay, wonderful. Thank you again to all the panelists. Um, you know, this is the first part of our conversation. We're going to continue um, throughout the day, hearing from more speakers, as well as having a breakout session to sort of come back to this more. Uh, dynamic uh, conversation that we want to continue. Uh, but actually right now we have uh, we have our lunch time. Um, so if I pull up our agenda, um, we are now on lunch um, from now until uh, 1.30. And at 1.30 Eastern time, we are going to resume with uh, lightning talks that will survey all of the recent uh, developments. And I can tell you that <laughs> most of the topics that were hit on here are also covered um, in that set of lightning talks. So, so I think that those who are interested in still hearing that full perspective um, and, and getting a really good picture of the technologies that are available uh, would be well served to come back for those, uh, those lightning talks uh, at 1.30. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, if you have more questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat, but otherwise we will uh, go uh, on a little pause until 1.30. Thank you everybody.